Hi, I'm George Norrie, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. Well, this is going to be one of the uh, perhaps most startling programs we've ever done uh, with some pretty serious information in it about Mars. And I, I'm not sure how else to begin other than to say uh, that's the reason we're starting in the first hour because of the, uh, the gravity of the show. Here from the mountains of New Mexico is Richard C. Hoagland. Richard, welcome. Good evening, Art. Good evening. This, welcome uh, back. Uh, thank you. Let's give some birth here. In other words, first, before we even begin down the trail of uh, how you got to where you are, what is the bottom line? Uh, are we, are you saying that there are architectural designs, uh, it, there, there is an, some sort of irrefutable proof of cities, I don't know if that's the right word, cities, uh, urban tight development, kind of like what they're talking about off the coast of Cuba, on Mars, and that you've uncovered this information with the new IR uh, color data. Is that the bottom line? That's the bottom line. And in fact, it's very eerie you should bring up the Cuba you know, ruins because we have found these roughly at the same depth under Sidonia that the Cuban ruins were found by Paulina Zelitsky off of Cuba. That's 2,200 feet. Roughly half a mile down. Now, the reason that I'm on the show tonight and the reason we're publishing, we over at Enterprise have a, we have the press release. We sent out a press release to 4,000 members of the mainstream press yep. all over the world today. I've got a copy of the press release here. It's uh, like seven pages long. <laughs> well, five pages long. I'm it's sorry. five pages with background, yeah. but yeah. obviously the, the, the important stuff is in the first two or three paragraphs. Mm -hmm. um, we have been working on this ever since this audience, your audience, while you were on vacation, <laughs> working very hard with the leadership of George in that, in that chair. And George does really a, a damn good job. He certainly does. He was able to get enough people to email and fax NASA and the folks at ASU, Arizona State University, the project leadership of the Mars Odyssey mission, to basically get kicked loose a daytime color infrared image of Sidonia. After months and months and months and months and months of foot dragging, and excuses, and oh, the dog ate it, and oh, it's not processed, and it's not calibrated, and it's on my dining room table, but I forgot to bring it in. I mean, everything possible. This audience, these people out there listening to us tonight, Art, stepped up to the plate one more time with feeling, mm -hmm. and did what good Americans do in the clinch. They made their voices heard, and they got something. Now, for a lot of this, initially, in the first few hours after we saw it posted on the website at ASU, we thought we'd been had once again. What do you mean? Well, because what we had demanded, what we'd asked for, was the nighttime infrared image yes. of Sidonia. Okay. My sources, and we'll get into this much later in the evening, much more heavily later in the evening, in Washington have told me unequivocally that what we really want to see, if after tonight you think you've seen anything on the daytime images, wait till you see the nighttime image because that's where the payoff is. That's where the big prize that I've been looking for now for 20-some years, namely the unequivocal proof of the ruins of an extraterrestrial civilization on Mars, apparently lie. You, you have the nighttime no, uh, IR? You do not? No, we know that it exists, and we're going to use everyone out there tonight to get it. All right, but... Um... But to what, to what, now, degree, to what to what degree of certainty, with regard to the, the, the photographs you've got now, mm -hmm. the daytime color IR photographs, mm -hmm. uh, with, to what degree of certainty can you sit here tonight and declare you have found archite architectural ruins on Mars? With the provision that the data we are looking at is real, which I'll get into in the next you know, hour or so, Yes, I would say that my confidence level is now 99.999999%. <laughs> In other words, I think it's I think it's there. All right, now, and there are a whole bunch of reasons that we're going to go through all the tests we've done, all the cross checking, all the the, the various inter scene, you know, uh, uh, 
viewings we've done, all of this comes up that we're looking at real data and what's really there is there. What makes this so extraordinary, Art, is this data did not come to us directly. It was filtered through a trusted colleague who has been working for a year or two with the NASA Ames Mars Web program doing image processing uh, for them as part of this worldwide uh, virtual Mars network that they've set up for investigators to plug in to NASA data anywhere in the world. And as part of that system, he has established a lot of contacts with the NASA Ames people, with people at, in Washington, other NASA centers, with uh, Dr. Malin and his group. And it was to him that this image actually was lovingly and cherishedly bequeathed, not to us. And we believe that this was part of someone's plan to give the data, the pristine, stunning, real, famous infrared data of Sidonia, not to Hoagland and company, who instantly would be accused of making everything up because, of course, we want it to be real, but to someone that was one of their own, someone that it would be a little harder to accuse of fabrication, of fraud, of hoax, et cetera, et cetera, as the spin doctors will go to work, and you know they will. Well, uh, so why don't I ask you right away, uh, to what degree are you certain that you have not been hoaxed? That's a very important question. Yep. Well, again, within the limits of the information we are able to wrest from NASA on these images. I don't, I don't need it to as many decimal points here. <laughs> they are not forthcoming at all about even the heritage of the images that they have published. There's no ancillary data for any of the images up on the Odyssey website tonight. There's no sun angles, there's no orbit numbers, there's no even day when they take the pictures. The pictures that are up there are the day they are released. They could be, you know, again, like Dr. Malin used to do, keep them in a drawer for months before they put them up. All right. Uh, so I am, to... You know, to answer your question, Art, I am extraordinarily confident because of the, of the way this image was acquired, and we're going to go into that in exquisite detail, the processing steps that were applied to it, we're going to go into that in great detail, and the character and integrity of the individual who got it, namely Keith Laney, and we'll go into that in detail. Okay, Keith Laney, then, is the man uh, associated with NASA, and what does he do? He is. He works on the East Coast. He lives in Charlotte, North Carolina, not far from where my old homestead used to be. Right. He is an independent uh, a contractor. He does image processing. He's been a member of the anomalous community, meaning he's looked at moon data and Mars data and whatever for years and years and years. And as I said, in the last year or so, he was accepted by the NASA program that NASA aims to work on data for them in preparation for the unmanned rover landings, seriously trusted by NASA. And I can announce tonight that he went to his bosses there and asked them if they would be interested in publishing the data we are publishing tonight ourselves? Yes. And they said yes. Back to your central question. What do we see? What is down there? Yep. Well, the whole reason for taking an infrared picture is because it isn't a black and white. It isn't a surface scan. It isn't looking merely at the top of Mars. But if you pick the right bands, if you pick the right wavelengths, you basically can get penetration into and beneath the surface of another planet. All right, infrared uh, photography, Richard, um, looks for heat signatures or looks for difference in heat. In other words, if Depends there's something, the if there's something, well, well right, but generally if, that's the. the well, if, 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 you're, if you're looking at shortwave infrared, it's basically light a little longer in wavelength than its reflection. Uh huh. The band CMOS, which stands for Thermal Emission Imaging System, you pegged it. This is a camera which is looking at heat right. being emitted. By objects. Right. So, for Mars. those who don't understand, uh, how you might see an object uh, beneath uh, the surface of Mars would be a delta, a difference between the heat on the surface and the heat beneath the surface. Exactly. Uh, it, that's what it's looking at, and that's how it's developing what you are seeing. Well, plus, Mars has a unique environment, and I think tonight, as we go through this, you're going to find that if, if Mars were not the place it is and have the unique history it has, we probably wouldn't be having this conversation because I don't think even the NASA people, even the FEMIS team understands, fully understands, although there is some indication from an abstract that the principal investigator of the FEMIS camera, Dr. Christensen, published this afternoon in Washington prior to the October uh, DPS meeting, which is a major scientific meeting 
uh, Division of Planetary Sciences that is held every year. Mm -hmm. um, he said that on other data taken by this camera since February, they've been in operation orbiting Mars, taking these kinds of infrared images since February of this year, February 18th. They have now found evidence of subterranean, submarsian, <laughs> subarian, <laughs> uh, valley networks of, of rivers that are not visible on either the Viking image or the Mars Global Surveyor. All right, well, that makes sense. Uh, water would be a different temperature. We know no, damn no, no, well. No, 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 no. These, these are dry rivers. valley networks. These are empty. These, are, these don't have water in them. Yeah, I know, but the IR signature still would be looking at a slightly different temperature when what it sees What the IR those. is doing, all right, and this is crucial to our case for Sedonia, is it's looking through the upper layers of the Martian dirt. Sure. It's on Mars. Sure. It isn't dirt. You made it, you used a term last night, which I thought was so incredibly appropriate. Your first night back, you Poof used dirt. a term that you had no idea uh, was going to be relevant to tonight. You t use the term poof dust or poof dirt. Poof dirt, yeah, we've got it out here. Well, on Mars, you have trillions of cubic meters of it. It hasn't rained on Mars in literally millions, if not more, years. How much poof dirt is uh, in the Sidonia region? According to, and this is going to really blow people's minds, according to an independent instrument on another spacecraft that everybody except us had forgotten, the laser, the laser pinger, yes. the device that is actually doing profile, or was up, well, up until the, the instrument broke a few months ago, doing profiling around Mars, Yes. the depth of the basin in which this city lies is almost as deep under Sidonia as the Grand Canyon. Wow. And the pinger, the laser used to do the profiles, is 10.6 microns. The images that we're looking at range from 6.62 to 12.58. So the laser is in the infrared, the thermal infrared, in the middle of the precise wave band we're looking at with these pictures. And so what we're seeing with the laser in terms of bottom profiling is apparently going down through an enormous amount of extraordinarily dry and finely divided dust. Poof dirt. Poof dirt. <laughs> with not water vapor or nitrogen or oxygen, but basically nothing but carbon dioxide. All right. Uh, let me ask this, Richard. What is uh, creating the difference in temperature at the artifacts you claim you found uh, from the poof Oh, dirt. you! Oh, you want to get it all out in the first hour, huh? Uh, I, I just want to understand technically all how right. you're, you're our initial confident, model was confident about these images. That we are very confident, as you yeah. will see. Yeah. All right. Our initial model was we're looking at stuff that's warmed by the sun. Mars is very cold, particularly in the northern hemisphere this time of year, because it's basically just spring. Right. Um, so the background is really, really, really cold. And how cold is it? It's like 130, 150 degrees below zero. Very cold. Very cold. Okay. So you have sunlight, which at Mars is roughly a quarter of sunlight here. But during the day from dawn to dusk, it will warm things up. And then at night, they'll cool off. How warm? Well, the, the actual ground rock temperatures probably get up to maybe 20 below zero. So it goes from 130 below at night to 20 below zero on the ground during, during the winter and spring. In the summer... At the equator, the temperature on Mars can go up to like 70, 80 degrees. 70 or 80, 80 degrees. degrees. ground temperature. Now, remember, the air is... But, is but in the area of question, the Zedonia yeah. region. Yep, which is at New York's latitude on Mars. It's going to degrees it's going range It's going to range between uh, minus 170 or so and, and minus 20. 150 at night, all right, to maybe minus 20, 30 in the daytime. Okay. Right how, now. Okay, so now I want to understand how it allows this difference to be seeing through this incredible uh -huh. amount of poof dirt. What, uh -huh. wh why is the temperature different below? Well, the, the, mob, the first model when we were looking at this, and we'll go into how we tripped over all this, we thought we were looking at structures that were basically sitting underneath the, uh, the poof dirt, the, the dust, which is, inc I mean, this is finer than talcum powder. This stuff has been pulverized and pulverized, and no one, I think, even the, the NASA people, have appreciated how it will drift and sit and stay in deep valleys and canyons. This is why Dr. Christensen is seeing these ancient river networks. Oh, I have no problem whatsoever believing that. I, I mean, when I told you I have poof dirt out here, and uh, th there are areas in the valley here where the poof dirt is like quicksand, Richard. You drop uh, a screwdriver yep. uh, or throw it a little bit, and it goes poof, and it disappears, just like something went into quicksand. And so 
this is probably a hundred to a thousand times worse. That's here on Earth. Yep. Uh, uh, okay, I can understand how that could occur. And it's because Mars hasn't had any water for so long. Understood, uh, right. with, with the exception of that which we've discovered underneath well, that's Mars, frozen. in Mars. That is frozen. Well, ice. It's not been released in a hydrological cycle. There's right. no rain clouds or thunderstorms right. on Mars. Right. But what, now, get to it. How is there a difference in... Ah. Well, the first model we had was that the sunlight, infrared energy, heat energy from the sun, was warming stuff up underneath the poof dirt during the day. And as it warmed it up, it would warm it up differentially. In other words... Things that are dark will absorb more energy than things that are light. Makes sense, right. And then they would begin to, to, to radiate their own heat. And that would come back up through the dust. All right, all of that makes sense. But to, to the infrared camera, the dust is almost as transparent as glass. It doesn't see the dust particles because the wavelength of energy is so long, it diffracts around the dust. Isn't it critical to understand whether that heating can occur to the depth that you're talking about? That's here? the crucial question. Okay. So the more we looked at this, and if you look in detail at the images, and you match them with the MOLA profiles, we have a shallow area north of the face on Mars. Remember, this is the region of the infamous face. The shallow region is only a few hundred feet below the surface. The region below the face, to the south of it, across that basin, is down to 3,000 feet arc below the surface that we see. My God. And we, I started working the other night with Ron Nix, who's our... Now, I, I think I just understood why you want the night photographs. Because oh, at yes. night, the surface cools. The, uh, the, uh, the differential between that which you're trying to see uh, and the surface is much greater. Exactly. With Mars, we know, was a very different place. It had an atmosphere. It had uh, moisture. It had water. It had all the ingredients that you'd need for life before something happened to Mars. And that's another argument in another program probably, but it certainly had the setup for life. No question about it. So could there have been an entire civilization then covered up uh, in the manner being described tonight? Um, uh, should there not be cities found? Uh, actually, I've got a couple of questions, Richard. Shouldn't there be cities found not just here uh, at Sidonia, but perhaps uh, in many regions of Mars? Precisely. Uh, the answer to that is yes, then. Yes. Right. And Somebody the Soviets else? back in 1989, hard, with the same kind of thermal infrared camera system, yes. they found some. And uh, they published their data. Somebody uh, and no one believed them. fast blasting me from Arizona says, come on, BS, thermal infrared energy can't see through more than about 100 microns of dust. Well, then those people don't know what they're talking about. Uh, okay. Um, all right. Um, how are you, is there any way that you can technically substantiate the fact it could look through that much, even light dust? Yes, because of the laser. If, uh, I had a long discussion this afternoon with Ron Nix, who is, as you know, is one of our geologists. And of course. preparing a, a, a paper, a technical paper on this. We'll publish uh, later in the week or maybe early next week. Every time we give an estimate as to how long it's going to take us to do something on this, it's just so extraordinary, and we have to check so many things. Yeah. It just takes long. I understand the workload must Murphy's be incredible. Murphy's sure. Yeah, of course. Anyway, so Ron and I were discussing, and and he was is, is dumbfounded by by this this entire panoply of evidence. The most striking thing to him and to me came out of a conversation that we had literally three nights ago. This was in the interregnum before we were going to come on the last time. Yes. What happened was a conversation with Ron. What is striking and what. Uh, Ron and I were discussing is if you go look at the strip, you see there's this rectilinear block-like pattern. Yes. It's not absolutely regular. If it was, we would immediately dismiss it as noise, ringing, some kind of electronic artifact. Okay. And the whole strip is 125 miles long. Gotcha. This is 2,000 square miles of Martian real estate. Okay. All right? Yes. They appear to have little bright rims. In the, in the north of the face. Uh, yes, I assume that's the IR overlay. That's the IR. Overlay. What yes, we're okay. seeing is multiple colors. Yeah. We're seeing fissures between them. We're seeing the tops brighter than the sides below them. Well, well, okay, seeing... that, that's, that's a pretty good uh, argument that you, the IR is doing what you say it's doing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And the, and the reason is that this is a very long wavelength. I mean, to the particles that, were, that are there, the dust particles, which are very, very tiny, this is like transparent. This energy goes right around them. 
And it's like uh, looking through a frosted window. In other words, if you are looking at a scene through a window which is illuminated at a side angle and the window is, is scattering light, yep. then you look through the best the best definition would be you're looking through a windshield driving west uh, toward the afternoon sun, the setting sun. Gotcha. And you haven't cleaned your windshield in about 10 years. Okay. You have a hell of a time as a driver if that's the case. Uh, that's right. Because there's a landscape out there which is being lit by sunlight, but the window is scattering sunlight as well. Oh. Now around it, you see this strange geometric pattern. And you can see that you've got edges to them. You've got bright rims. Ron and I were discussing this, and, and, and suddenly I said, you know, the biggest thing they're going to accuse us of is simply looking at noise. I said, it's too bad there isn't an independent way to, and then I stopped and I said, oh, my God, because there was. Like what? The MOLA laser on Mars Global Surveyor. All right? So Ron and I are looking at this, and I said, Ron. So you're looking beneath a canyon filled beneath. with dust. Exactly. And no one, not even my dear friend Arthur C. Clarke, who wrote a brilliant novel that I always loved about the moon called Fall of Moon Dust. Incredible novel. Everybody's got to get this novel. Who, who put together this scale? I, I did. You did. Well, the scale is from MOLA. The scale is from the official MOLA project. Which but, I mean, for example, in the very darkest blue, you know you're looking down uh, minus 4,700 feet. Meters. Meters, rather. Now, remember, this is relative. So what you do is you subtract it from the dust level, which is the yellow. Understood, yes. Okay. Now, this was not, this scale is not made up by us. This is made up by Dr. David Smith and his colleagues at the Goddard Space Flight Center. All right, that's My old alma mater. Yep, yep. Who's the principal investigator on the Moly experiment on Mars Global Surveyor. All right, so the guy who says you can't look uh, past uh, millimeters is full of it there. He's because full of obviously, dust, yes. obviously, you can't. Full of. Uh, this is called science, booster. everybody. All right, okay, fine. I'll buy that. But this, this is what's so, so wild art. Look at the details of the Moly scan, all right? Why would it have stair-step profiles? Mars did once have, uh, you know, atmosphere and a lot of things it doesn't have now, like water. A long, long time long ago. long time ago. Yep. But, Richard, in the, uh, if you consider the Grand Canyon, good example, right? Or uh, maybe the Teton. Now, Grand Canyon's better. Go ahead and consider the Grand Canyon. If uh, Earth had a catastrophic event mm -hmm. and the Grand Canyon were to fill up with dust blowing from wind, uh, which is, you know, after some, I don't know, after something hits a planet or something awful catastrophic happens. Right. Why couldn't I imagine the Grand Canyon filling with dust? Oh, you could. And it looking uh, at IR just about the way this looks here. Well, because there's no structure down, there's no rock structure that would give you this rectilinear pattern. These kind of patterns in, in, in terrestrial geology are very limited. They're usually mud cracking. They're They're on a very small scale. They're not on this vast scale. They're not on the scale of Los Angeles. I mean, we're looking at an at area here the size of the Los Angeles Basin. This is like you flew over Los Angeles and took a thermal infrared picture if the basin was filled with dust. That, the, that, that one protrusion uh, at about the center of this canyon must be incredibly high. Let's see. It would be... Oh, my God, we're looking at uh, thousands of meters high. Well, it's about uh, 900 feet. 900 feet. Yeah, well, the face, you know, is 1,500 feet tall. Mm -hmm. We always said the face was 1,500 feet tall. And well, remember that the, the, the traces do not go directly across the face. It's just as a glancing blow on this particular orbit. There's all right, to me, Richard, down. I'm just a common person, but you have made the case to me that you are looking through this dirt yep. at what is below. But you have not proven to me yet that this is anything other than looking down through the dirt at the geology below. Okay. Nobody on the MOLA team has said there is a, there's a canyon in Sidonia under that dust that's as deep as the Grand Canyon, have they? No. Nope. They have been incredibly silent, haven't they? And everyone who's looked at the Mola Trace briefly has just assumed that you were looking at stuff on the surface. You know, the guy from uh, Arizona, who I presume is at ASU, claiming you can only look through 100 microns of dust with this wavelength? Yes. Wrong, pale face, wrong. The Mola data itself at 10.6 microns is going down 3,000 feet and coming back up through this stuff. Now, our operative model, and this is where things get really interesting, Art, is that it's not just dust. I'll be damned if this doesn't look like a suburb. You know, it could be factories, it could be homes, 
it could be a combination thereof. It could be L.A. <laughs> no question. Richard? Um, Let me tell you how we produced it, all right? Okay. Because, again, this was done in a very unusual way for us. It was done arm's length, literally 2,000 miles between here and, and North Carolina. And the primary hero here tonight is Keith Laney. There are actually nine bands on the original data, but two of them are, are duplicates because of signal-to-noise uh, technical issues. Yes. So you have eight bands of infrared data. Okay. Eight colors would be another way of looking at it. All right. The way you're, you have to work with this multispectral data, because it isn't black and white, it isn't visual imagery, is very different than we usually use with black and white images. Sure. He learned a phenomenal amount and actually got very cozy with a very big company called Kodak and a division of theirs called Research Systems, Inc., that provided him an enterprise for an indefinite period, what I have been laughingly calling the Lexus of Imaging Programs. It's a program called NV3.5, which is about a $7,000 computer program. And it's this state-of-the-art program which allows you to basically do all this with point-and-click, and tutorials, and I mean, it's it's basically flying a 747 as if you've never flown one before, but you're a, you're a grandmaster at it. And it was this software and their tutorials and Keith's very bright learning curve that allowed him to come up the curve and to produce the data we were talking about tonight. All right. The key question I've had from the beginning, in fact, I was the one that basically said at some point, guys. I don't think we're looking at noise. I think we're looking at real structures down there. No, this and they doesn't... all kicked and screamed yeah. and said, oh, come on, Richard. No, it doesn't look like noise. Richard, um, can well, you... Well, let me, let me make one more point. Okay, but I, I, this really is important. I, I said it at the beginning of the hour. I want to have some estimation of the scale of the objects yeah. that we're seeing. I was reading your mind. Okay. So you're looking at things that are about the size of city blocks, big city blocks. Big city blocks. Now, keep in mind, this is Mars. The gravity currently is one-third that of Earth. We have always assumed in our work, we've never really talked about it, that if we were dealing with Martians, yes, we were dealing with big Martians. Because of the lesser gravity. The lesser gravity and several other factors that will be in the, the sequel to Monuments. So uh, clearly said they would build big. Big. And Ron and I actually went through some calculations the other night, you know, comparing things we build that are big, like Mount Rushmore and all that. Yes. It's all proportional. There's nothing here that is untoward in terms of the model that we're looking at some relatives of the human species. Remember, I've always said... We you know, I, for the first time, Richard, I'm willing to look at this, and I'm willing to say, clearly, if this is real, then this is architecture. This yeah. could not possibly be artificial. This is not a bunch of rocks like I'm usually seeing. What I'm looking at here is architectural. It's not natural. It's a gosh darn city. <laughs> this was my key indicator, because if this pattern, if, 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 as you said a moment ago, if some wacky grad student at ASU had basically pulled a huge hoax on us here yeah. and stuck an aerial photograph of L.A. over a Themis image, yeah. it wouldn't know to respect the objects that are above the dust that we've been looking at for the last 20 years. No, I will agree with you that uh, it's contiguous. Uh, that is a crucial part of the model because yeah, yeah. the stuff underneath respects the stuff on top. Yeah, I'm with you. And that's what real architecture would do. This is a very important part of the story. In fact, it's the most important part, I think, of this entire mystery. About a month before this image was released, a gentleman showed up at the Enterprise Electronic Conference called BAMF, B-A-M-F, which is obviously a, a, a screen name, a pseudonym. And he began posting. In fact, he, he posted some peculiar th threads, one of which call, was called, uh, where's the science happen around here? Very provocative, very in your face. He turns out to be none other than a gentleman named Noel Gorelick, who is the manager of the Themis ASU Mars Computation Center, which literally is working with Dr. Christensen as part of the team with 14 programmers under him. How do you know it's him? Because Dr. Christensen, in an email to us, acknowledged that Noel Gorlick is who, who this guy is. Okay. And he's admitted it to everybody. Mm -hmm. And the ISPs check and the, where he logs on and all this. So, no, this is the guy. He started hanging out at Enterprise a month before this image came to light, before it was released. And he stayed and stayed and stayed, and he sent all kinds of private emails. He's posted all kinds of material on the website, 
He is engaged in long, complicated chats with various people, and he picked out certain people like Keith and a gentleman in Germany called uh, Holger Eisenberg and a couple of others to begin giving kind of private tutorials in how to work with infrared multispectral data. So he wanted you to get this. So I'm looking at this, you know me, I'm the political uh, cynic of, of the bunch. Yes. I think NASA wouldn't know a straight answer if, they, if it bit them. <laughs> and I was looking at this complicated setup, and I'm thinking, what is going on here? So when Keith related to me the next part of the story he's about to tell you, the light bulb kind of went on, and I said, oh, so that's the game. How are we not to know that this is some, not some sort of pixelated noise that we're looking at, e even as artificial as it would appear to be? Uh, after all, a camera is an artificial mechanism, and it will at times produce artificial artifacts. Well, for one thing, <laughs> the structures you're seeing are light years practically above the level of pixels. I mean, we're, we're, we're talking 10 to 100 times the size of, the, of the, each individual pixel. Thank you. For these buildings. All right, gotcha. More important. Good answer. The technique that we apply to this came from my astronomical background and Keith's in innovative, creative imagination. Because we're wrestling with this problem. You know, is this noise? Is this some kind of electronic interference? When he talked with Banff in the, in the email chats, uh, Mr. Gorlick admitted that they have these blocks on their raw data. Have you confronted uh, Mr. Gorlick um, with regards? We are, he is, by the way, right now presently in the Enterprise chat room, and he is calling Keith a liar. He's calling him a fraud. He's calling him a hoaxer. He's calling him every name in the book, Art. And the question is, why is an official NASA employee living at Enterprise? No, 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 no. My, my question, to our people, no, Richard, my question was, Yes. Uh, has he uh, directly admitted to you who he is? Oh, yeah. Oh, no no question. He is who he claims he is. Okay. The question, well, the, well, as the evening goes on, this gets more and more intriguing because his, his pen name, his surname, his, his screen name turns out to be a clever little code. All right? And I'll get to that in a minute. I want to go back to the images, though, because the data is crucial. The personalities aside, this data either is real or it's not. Would you agree? Yeah. Okay. So That's an easy call. It's either real or it's not. Yours? All right. So we have to somehow decide, based on the source of where Keith Laney got this, which was from the official Themis website, and it was on the evening of July 25th at 10.27 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, and he's got this in his computer list. Because, you know, as you, when you log on and download things, your computer makes a record of when you do that. That is correct, yeah. So we have data that will stand up in court as to where this image was procured and when it was procured. So then the question is, if this is a hoax, if this is some incredible, exquisite hoax, it's not us. It's folks at ASU. It's people either under Banff or Banff himself who has perpetrated this exquisite hoax. And, and, and what is Banff saying that, um, uh, that he Keith is, is lying about? He is that... that, that that this thing shows cities, structures, et cetera, et cetera, that he got it from the Themis website. In other words, he's claiming that Keith is lying about everything he's told you that, in the last uh, half that, hour. Uh, in other words, that this is an altered photograph. Yeah. Now, Beagle, I mean, you know, I'm calling this a curse, Richard. Uh, Two-thirds or better of the stuff that we or anybody else sends to Mars gets, uh, oh, I don't know, doesn't work. Uh, gets crashes into something, blows up, hit. That's a flu hanging on, folks. Um, or something happens. It's a curse. Well, I would generally agree with you that something bizarre is going on. In fact, in our last conversation, we talked about that the two thirds of all the missions that have gone to Mars no. have gone kaput. Right. Many, many years ago, when I was a fledgling reporter, you know, just a neophyte with with uh, CBS, working for Walter, they sent me out to JPL for. Oh, the first time. And I remember wandering into an office one afternoon, and I saw this blackboard. And it had a whole bunch of equations scribbled on it. And it had to do with the Mariner uh, 6 and 7 at that time that were about to arrive at Mars. This was a couple of days after the Apollo 11 landing. And we'd all moved, all of us that had covered Apollo 11, with, which was incredible, up the street from Downey, where North American Rockwell had their headquarters, where I had 
literally built a solar system in an abandoned aircraft hangar right. that we could wander through. They moved us all up the street to JPL to Pasadena to cover the flybys of Mars, which were literally only the second flyby that the United States had ever sent. The first one was Mariner 4 in 65, and this was now Mariner 6 and 7 in, in, in 69. So we, we get there, and no sooner had we arrived than there's a bulletin that they had lost uh, contact with one of the spacecraft. There were two spacecraft en route. Right. And we all rushed back to JPL because you know, the guys had their pagers, and there, there were no cell phones in those days. It was literally little beeps, and then you went and found a phone somewhere. Sure. So we dashed back from La Cunada, which is right next door to Pasadena, maybe a mile away. We were having lunch. We rush into the press room, and we you know, see that one of our spacecraft is missing. Well, that afternoon I wandered up on the hill to go and do some interviews with somebody, and I happened to go by this office, and there was this blackboard. And there was this whole list of things that might have gone wrong as to why they were no longer listening to one of the two spacecraft. Right. And at the top of the list, in chalk, on the blackboard, was big letters, G, G, G. So, of course, being young, G, G. I bit. And I said brightly, what's a G, G, G? Right. And the engineer standing at the blackboard turned and looked at me and he says, well, that's the great galactic ghoul. What? <laughs> Even <laughs> then... Art, they had a name for this curse. The Great Galactic The Great Galactic Ghoul. Ghoul. And what they described to me was that they had noticed that a lot of the spacecraft that we and the Russians at that time, the Soviet Union, had tried to send to Mars even as early as 1969 never made it. And they, this some wag, some, you know, clown had basically put down the idea that there was this big you know, galactic monster out there eating spacecraft headed for Mars. Uh -huh. Well, it was tongue-in-cheek, of course, but over the years, as more and more missions have gone from more and more countries, the Japanese are the latest to to fall prey a couple, three weeks ago, you know, it, it, it's, it's not much of a joke. No. Because when two-thirds of the very expensive hardware you send to one place goes poof, you've got to wonder what's going on. Now, in our last conversation... You said you were voting for aliens. Yeah, I, yeah. given a choice between that and what else? Well, what else is sabotage? The, what else is humans here on Earth who are desperately trying to keep as long as possible the delay of the day? Yes, yeah, so let, let us be when clear. We know the, what's there. The great secret cabal. Yeah, but it's not a great cabal. It only has to be some guy well, with a It's got to be driver. pretty great. I mean, there there is uh, NASA. There's the United States government. Uh, there is, you know, I mean, <laughs> it's got to be pretty big, Richard, uh, to control what happens to U.S. and Russian and Japanese spacecraft no, on the way to Mars. All it has to be is the right guy at the right place at the right time with a screwdriver. Because if you're dealing with civilian programs, Let's, let's take the U.S. And, and, and the British on this latest mission, for example, where scientists would be loath to even begin prior to the concept of terrorism to think that civilian spacecraft headed out there where there's nothing of monetary value and nothing of social value, well, it's pure science, Well, you know, no one would even... Think of the idea of sabotage. Therefore, there's no security. Well, I think you and I both know there's more there than that. That's but, what. But, that's but why we're sitting here talking don't. tonight. Uh, anyway, well, you know, that's an exaggeration. I mean, what does one guy with a screwdriver do? Come on, there are layers of security. That's what you would think, wouldn't you? Yes. Except I know for a fact, reported to me from a very good source at Cape Canaveral, that during the during the launch of Mars Observer in 1992. Just before the launch, remember Hurricane Andrew? Yes. And how it barreled down on Florida? I do. Well, they thought it would sweep across Cape Canaveral, and they had this fragile spacecraft standing out there on the pad. So they brought it back to its its uh, hangar. I remember that, yes. And they you know, put alternate power on and air conditioning and all that. Well, when the hurricane went south and missed uh, Canaveral, they then unbuttoned all those precautions for the storm. And they found that, lo and behold, somehow someone had dumped a kitchen sink full of garbage on the spacecraft sitting in the nose cone on the top of the rocket. 
pretty incredible. There were iron filings, newspapers, bits of glass, all kinds of bizarre junk, garbage. And there was no way that this stuff could get through the filters because the filters are micron-sized screens well, all right. the air hoses. All right, horrid as that so is. So it's obvious though. that somebody tried to sabotage our first mission back to Mars. Granted. Since Viking. Granted. Ah, but I'm not done. Okay. When they took the spacecraft back to the uh, clean rooms there at the Cape yes. to frantically clean it, yes. and they had to dissemble parts of it to make sure that nothing got inside, Right. they then found that someone somewhere, probably at JPL, had smeared Vaseline <laughs> over the lens of the camera art. What? <laughs> so these were two hits <laughs> by two groups determined that we would never get any pictures of what's on Mars from that mission. All right, but, but Then, as you know, when it was en route, three days before it got to Mars in 1993, it Disappeared. Yes, I recall Oof. that. Yes, and no one ever heard from it. Uh, but again. okay, but that, that's that's bad news on one mission. Bad. I, I mean, my God, Richard, Decrible. we're talking about we're talking about Russian. Uh, Where was the security yard from, from Russia? Wait, 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 from wait, wait, wait. Where was the security? Beats the hell out of me. At JPL, it was sabotaged with Vaseline. At the Cape, during the hurricane, garbage thing was sabotaged with garbage, and then it up and went poof out at Mars. Yeah. So where was the security? to admit which called Al-Qaeda, if you have a small but determined group that really have long-range plans and will carefully wait for years if necessary to put a key man in a key position as a janitor with security clearances. Yes. I mean, how many airlines now have reported, you know, uh, stunning examples of people, employees, who are, by the way, yep. there they are? Yep. So even in an era of incredible paranoia about security, there is no real security if you're determined. So the space program has stood naked because it was a civilian space program to begin with. But uh, the very theory that would embody the final screwdriver action, essentially, you're trying to tell us occurred, would have to be gigantic in the sense of very high-level people having made a decision that, Ooh, there's secret stuff on Mars, and we can't let the people see it. And so we're going to have to stop all these spacecraft going up from all these different places. And, and, and by nature, that would be a very high-level operation. Mm, at least. It was doing. All it takes is a determined small group. And the smaller the group, by the way, the better, because your security is higher. You know, the old, the old uh, crack about, you know. But this would be a high-level decision. I mean, the assumption is. That no, no, we, no, no. We, you're, talking about, you're talking about a competing group within the system that doesn't agree that we should now be made aware of this. Yes. Well, but, and do but, their damnedest to Richard, make sure we're not. For them to be aware of what is there and have, and, and by nature, or, or by necessity, rather, they would have had to have kept that secret from us. They, for them to be aware of it in the first place means they're pretty highly placed because they had inside information about what's really on Mars. Yeah, but why do you say they have to be highly placed in, in, the, in the NASA system? Because that, that, because that information uh, would only go to highly placed people, no, i.e. what's you on are Mars. Assuming, you are assuming that all the information that we're currently getting you know, from space is the first time we've ever had this information. If, in fact, it's not, if, in fact, there are ancient documents held in secret by secret societies okay. passed down from generation to generation All to right. generation. That would be at a high level. Not when you say high level, remember what Ed Mitchell said. He said there are two governments. There's the elected government, the constitutional government, then there's the other guys. Exactly, have Richard. The horse or a mad cow here. Remember Ken Johnston? Yeah. The NASA astronaut that you had on, who, by the way, has now been appointed a JPL solar system ambassador. Hmm. This is going to be very interesting to see what happens when he actually begins to ask some hard questions. But anyway, Ken, a few years ago, was on your show, and he talked about his sojourn at, uh, at, at Houston, at the Manned Spacecraft Center, when the Apollo data was coming back from the moon. Yes. Remember how he told the story that he and Thornton Page, who was a prestigious astronomer, uh, out of Wesleyan, a friend of mine, I knew, uh, I knew Thornton, I worked with him. Uh, Thornton and he one night were previewing film 
for the next day's review by various mission specialists. And on the back side of the moon from Apollo 14, he saw on this film that he had loaded up on the projector a stunning, shining city of lights on the dark side of a crater in the shadow on the far side of the moon. And they both were stunned. He took the film back and put it back in the vault where you had to go through multiple security to sign it in and sign it out. Right. The next day when he went to sign it out to show the whole team, when they got to that part of the film, the city wasn't there. And Thornton Page, when he met him in the hall afterwards, just smiled and said, I never saw anything. Now, Dr. Thornton Page, I found out years later, was a member of the Robertson panel which was the high-level CIA panel convened for several days in the 1950s, and 53, I believe, to review all UFO cases in the United States back when UFOs were considered a major security problem because they were clogging up the communications channels and preventing NORAD and other agencies from seeing real threats from the Soviet Union. Yes. So we have a member of the agency, the CIA, who sees something with a colleague of mine and a friend of yours, and then the next day, it's missing. And Ken said he took the film out of the projector, looked at it with a microscope, and there wasn't a break, there wasn't a, a splice. They had literally duplicated overnight the whole film and taken out the offending, stunning stuff. Now, that could have been agency. It could have been NASA. It could have been a combination of people in both. The point is, it happened, and someone of unimpeachable integrity who was there, who held high-level positions, vouchers for that happening, and it's not the first time that he saw something weird that he later began remembering and putting in context that that should not have taken place. Well, you and I both agree that something, uh, what's the right word? Uh, something, uh, yeah, uh, yes, I guess. Anomalous? I, uh, yes, I guess. Politically incorrect? Um, yes, all of that uh, is going on, that uh, something is being tampered with and something is woefully wrong. Let, let, let's go back to basics. Uh, let, Beagle 2, uh, exactly. it, it just has not... No, I may been... surprise you here, but I don't think Beagle 2 is fallen prey to this problem. I you, think you Beagle huh? 2, if in fact it is lost, and we don't know that yet, in fact... About half an hour ago, when you were just coming on the air, yes. there was an overflight by Mars Odyssey, the U.S. spacecraft, over the landing site of Beagle 2 there in Acetus Planitia. And? And by 3.30 this morning Eastern Time, which is 1.30 our time, they are supposed to tell us if Odyssey heard Beagle 2's call sign. Okay, so we don't know yet. So we don't know yet. Uh -huh. But we but, know but, they've had three previous attempts all silent. All silent, including with this huge radio telescope at Jodrell Bank in England. So the beagle's not barking. The beagle is not barking. Okay. So why do I not think that it's fallen prey to sabotage? For one thing, look what it was trying to do. It was trying to land and for the first time find evidence of microbes on Mars. Right. Not big stuff, not artifacts, not cities, not... You know, the really cool stuff that you and I think is there. I, I think, well, wasn't it Arthur C. who said large life? Well, he was talking biology. He's, he's thinking that we're bushes. Remember trees and stuff? Oh, yes. At, at the South Pole, where yes. we now know there's a heck of a lot of water. Well, that's large life. Now, the odds of dropping, you know, a little tiny thing the size of a barbecue pit down on a planet with a surface area equivalent to all of Earth Mars has the same surface area as all the continents of Earth. And the little place it was going to land, which is this plain east of Sirius Major, was almost picked at random because of the vagaries of celestial mechanics. Remember, Beagle 2 was a, was a hitchhiker on Mars Express. So it had to kind of wind up on Mars where Mars Express was going, yes. not where it really wanted to go itself. So... What Colin Pillinger, who was the scientist in charge, said a few days ago, he said, my bet is if we land anywhere on Mars, we have a better than 50-50 chance of finding life. Now, he didn't mean big guys. He didn't mean, you know, Martian elephants or, you know, the ruined abandoned cities that we're talking about. He, Even microbial life would microbes. be, well, that would be fine. It would be big news, wouldn't it? It would be huge news, yeah. and it would move the whole story further up the curve.
occurs. Yes, sir. Remember, this is what the two MER missions, the two fossil life on Mars. Now, what Pillinger's Beagle 2 could have done if it survived with its little robot arm, which they elegantly called a paw <laughs> for positional adjustable workbench. <laughs> Somebody had to work really hard for that acronym. <laughs> Anyway, it was going to extend its paw on which there were, were two stereo cameras and a, and, and a drill and some uh, instrumentation designed to measure composition and yeah. really neat gadgets in an incredibly tiny space on this little arm that the, the Beagle clamshell would extend once it landed and survived on the surface. But it couldn't, it, it couldn't look any farther around itself physically with something called a mole, by the way, that would burrow into the soil. Well, actually, though... And maybe it, a couple of feet. It, it might not matter. I mean, if there's microbial life on Mars, then probably it's common. If it's common, then you're going to find some bit of it just about anywhere. Well, that's the theory, and that's a very good good idea. In other words, once you start, once you find life there, presuming it's not contamination, you haven't brought it with you, you know, then... Everything is wide open because from well, see, microbes... But, but, but by your own words, there you have it, Richard. If there's microbial life yep. confirmed yep. on Mars, then uh, Pandora's box, begin, Pandora's the, the box lid starts open. to come open. Okay, yeah. so why am I voting against conspiracy and sabotage for Beagle 2? I don't, I don't know because it's so unlike you. Well, let me tell you why. Why? I mean, most of what I try to do and talk about art has a reason. Okay. I'm, I'm trying to be logical here okay. and consistent. All right. The U.S. missions that are going to land... Yes. Eight hundred million dollars. Oh. Close to a billion. A lot of money. A giga gigabuck. The but on Christmas morning, three hundred and forty-five million dollars. Mm. Close to half a gig. All right. Mm -hmm. Beagle two, thirty-five million dollars. Pocket change. Well. And the problem is that landing is the hardest thing. You got to get down to the atmosphere. Things have to happen in sequence. The if, if if you land wrong, if the airbag hits a rock, a sharp edge razor blade type rock, bang! There goes your spacecraft splat all over the surface. Sure. So for a little amount of money, they were trying to pull off a miracle, and I got to hand it to Colin Pillinger. He put together an incredible team. There's an incredible team spirit. I feel so for these people tonight because they're sitting there desperately hoping against hope that it's merely a communications problem or a computer problem, mm. and it isn't that the spacecraft no longer exists. But the odds are, given how many spacecraft have failed with m mucho bucks, that this trying to do it on a shoestring, something went wrong somewhere in that sequence of events in the seven minutes from entering the atmosphere to landing, and through no one's fault, it simply didn't work. Well, that's the odd. But that is not consistent with uh, the other things you've said. Because the money's not equal, Art. If well, money were even equal, so, Richard, the reporting back of microbial life mm -hmm. existing on Mars mm -hmm. would be, I mean, gigantic news and and would lead to the rest of it. So why aren't you consistently saying this was sabotaged? Because as we're comparing apples and oranges. If we had a $800 million mission and it went splat, then I'd say, aha. Uh -huh. But the fact is that these things are incredibly difficult. I mean, look how close Pathfinder came to disaster, and it was in a $150 million range, all right? Yeah. And that was, you know, gold is faster, better, cheaper. Now, I will totally admit that there is some logic to what you're saying. And if there is a cabal that wants to keep us from ever knowing that there's even a microbe alive on Mars, yes. maybe they did something. There you have it. But that's a maybe. I'm betting on this particular instance that it was the um, just the fates because of the small amount of money, relatively speaking. Now, one of the reasons I'm saying that is because the real threat here, the threat politically and scientifically, is not Beagle 2. It's Mars Express itself. All right. Because, as I've said, Mars Express carries a double whammy. Mars Express is ours, and it's no, in... No, 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 it's, it's the European. It, I'm sorry, and it's in orbit, right? It's in Around orbit Mars? safely. Yes. It, it literally got there safely. It's in perfect health. It carries among its instrument, you know, array, two instruments which can blow the doors off artifacts and former intelligence on Mars. Not microbes, but the big guys. 
One is the high-resolution stereo will stand up in court. The other surprise, the other amazing double whammy on the Mars Express mission is the MARSIS instrument, M-A-R-S-I-S, which is an acronym that stands basically for Mars Radar. Okay. For the first time in the history of the space program, Art, mankind, the Europeans this time, have sent a real radar. Martian cities. You got it. Now, what I find stunning about this is that our previous U.S. spacecraft were supposed to carry this kind of radar, and at the last minute, after George Shultz went to the Soviet Union and had a little meeting with Shevardnadze, who was the foreign minister yes. of the Soviet Union at that time, they pulled off the radar unit and they substituted the laser unit, which only bounced signals off the surface. Now, wait a minute. You said George Shultz, George uh, Shultz. shortly uh, he was after meeting with... Secretary of State. Yes, yes, I recall. Ronald I, I well recall. Uh, meeting with Shepard Nazi, you said. Uh, well, okay, yeah, that's... He was a, Foreign Secretary Okay, at that so time. the implication of your statement is that um, at that level, some information was exchanged, which resulted in that in a, radar being removed. In a change of the instrument... Okay, Richard, a, that's what I call a high level. Yeah, but that's not sabotage. That's a change of... And, and for what reason? Well, all right. If you have radar, you probe beneath the surface. Yeah, see, I'm trapping you, Richard. I, I, no, I, you're I'm, not. I'm going, yes, I am. No. I'm going back to... That's a high level. That's a high level. If they had it removed, mm -hmm. it was because they would have seen the Martian cities. That's right. Well, okay. Too that's soon. Too, too soon. 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 Too soon. Okay. Well, Remember, that's... we have always said there seems to be a timetable, a clock. But by what you're saying, that puts Schultz and Shevardnadze in the in the in the cabal, in a sense. Yeah, but it doesn't account for sabotage. Sabotage is different than planned time release aspects. Well, there's all kinds of sabotage. I mean, if you remove the instrument that would prove, if you remove the instrument that the scientists want. Yeah. And put on one of lesser caliber that can give them some data, but not the incriminating right. data. Right. Right. All you're doing is delaying the inevitable. All right, but it, you might as well say it's the proverbial screwdriver. I mean, it's not. It, it, well, Samples it is. Apples and oranges, come on. Well, <laughs> it's policy. But, but Yes, Richard, you know? but same end effect. Yeah, but there's two different ways of doing things. One is from the inside, sophisticated, smooth, without, without seams. And the other is the monkey wrench. Hmm. The monkey wrench is used when you don't have access to the levers of power. I know, but it, it's... Can't affect but, the decision-making to carefully steer everybody away from the prize until the appropriate time. Okay. We're, 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 we're not going to call the sack here. Uh, what I'm simply saying is now, in 2003, 2004, the Europeans have got a real radar on that spacecraft, which is functioning perfectly in orbit tonight, and which will, uh, if I can call up a, a very important email I got here, um, give us some pretty astonishing data, okay? Huh. Now, well, if we if we suddenly get pictures of Martian cities just under the surface, don't you think that's going to shake everything up a little? More than a little. More than a little. That's why I'm saying I'm betting on Mars Express. And if if we were dealing with sabotage that had taken out Beagle, yes, it would have been a much more important target to take out Mars Express. Huh. Now, mission. I don't know whether the Mars Express people have better security. The I mean, mission. Europeans tend to be a little more security conscious than we are. The mission is not finished yet. Yeah. I want to talk to you about that. Okay. All right. Um, you know, in case anybody thinks these arguments are trivial and not meaningful. That question, because, you know, where the rubber meets the road is these are not decisions being made in a vacuum. These are not people who are pulling strings and keeping us from knowing things or knowing it until a certain time, mm -hmm. because they have nothing better to do. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's, a, there's a strategy here. There's a political agenda. And there has been, apparently, since the dawn of the space program. And it goes back to your favorite document, Art, the Brookings Report. Right. And, you know, when I, when I say that the Beagle, too, may just have fallen prey to not enough money, it's not that I don't believe it could have been sabotaged. I'm looking at the one that they should have aimed for, which is the one that is going to give us some extraordinary information if the system is honest and if the Europeans are as independent as her. The official trend curve. We have gone since 1997 
inexorably, mission by mission by mission, closer to the admission that there is some kind of life currently on Mars. Well, I certainly admit there's been movement. Uh, but and would you like to plot the data points, or do you want me to do it? Well, no, go ahead. Okay, well, for instance, we start out with a totally sterile Mars, and then we suddenly say, well, maybe there could have been water. Yeah. Maybe there could have been a lot of water. Yeah. Then we get Odyssey in orbit. We get the GRS instrument, and my God, pole to pole. It's dripping with water. Of course, yes. it's frozen. Yes. Then, of course, remember, we published a paper a couple of years ago claiming that at the equator... By, by the way, Richard, is, is all the um, reported water on Mars, and I, I went through the maps with you, as did uh, many in the audience, mm -hmm. is all of that holding up because the, the water on uh, the moon story kind of collapsed. It comes and goes, doesn't it? Yes, it does. And, and so I'm wondering... is no, the, the water on Mars is not only holding up, but, but there, there's, there's new news. I mean, this is like drip, 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 okay, okay. unintended. Well, drip some on me. Okay. Well, we had said in our, in our Mars paper, our, our, our title paper, which is on the Enterprise Mission website for those who want to read it, that when Odyssey got there, it would find water not merely at the poles and downed at some latitude, but it would find two clusters of, of hydrogen or ice at the equator 180 degrees apart. And we based that prediction on these weird, dark, Stains. Yeah, and you hit it on the mark. I mean, you did. The I give you that. You totally hit it. Totally, exactly. That's called science. Yep, art, you right? did it. No uh, Ouija board here. That's you, science. You I predicted want to they would credit, find the water and they found it. I, I give want to credit Efren Palermo and, and Jill England for doing a yeoman service and doing all those maps and helping us make that very specific prediction. Now, the three of us have said, the four of us actually, because Mike Bear is in the mix here too, have said that those dark stains, uh, our, our water, in fact, I published on Enterprise in the summer of 2000, the first claim, and we sent press releases all over the world, every major news agency on the planet, that we had seen evidence of liquid water, yes. stains, yes. stunning silence yes. from everybody, including NASA. Yep. Well, a year or so ago, papers started appearing at these various conferences saying, well, these things might not be avalanches after all. Yeah. They could be water. No, you hit it. Well, with that trend curve, remember, if you don't have water, you can't have life. That's right. So the next data point. You also which, can't make fuel and you can't do a nope, lot of things. Nope, I mean, nope, it's, let's, let's just look at the life angle for right, a second here. Right. Without water, you ain't got life. We now know that Mars is a planet awash in water. Right. Most of it is frozen. But near the equator, at these two places, these poles apart places, it appears to be wet. The, the data shows that during the summer when the temperatures are above the freezing point, you get these dark stains. And when the temperature goes down, the stains disappear. Yes. They behave like liquid water. Well, there's so much water now available in, in these niches that the next data point that we would predict for either the NASA missions arriving in a few days or the Beagle 2 mission, which was supposed to have arrived Christmas morning, is that they would find microbes. In fact, Pillinger was so confident that he was going to find evidence of living microbes, it's almost like he already had a heads up from somewhere that it was, it was a foregone conclusion if he just got his spacecraft down there safely. Mm -hmm. So I see officially the tidal wave here, mixing our metaphors, Natalie, is that the next data point has got to be we either confirm fossil evidence of former microbes, that's with the MER missions, or current microbes, which would have been Beagle 2. Mm -hmm. Now, the huge leap, of course, is what we're expecting, which is at some point we've got to get pregnant with ruins, artifacts, yep. which brings me to this remarkable memo coming out of JPL. Let me give you a little background. This came to me from a source, and I don't have permission to use this source's name. It's not the same source that just called me, by the way. It's another source. You can't do this without sources, folks. Anyway, and I don't have permission to quote the guy's name from JPL, but I can give you where he works. Inside JPL. He's inside JPL. He is working for the MRO project. He is a senior engineer on the MRO project, okay. which is the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter which is the next NASA mission, unmanned mission, going into orbit around Mars in 2005, 
and it will be able to photograph in color and in stereo art objects theory is that because of what this administration has done in Iraq and other places and the resultant reaction from Europe which has been so scathing <laughs> and how this administration has thumbed its nose you know and the, the latest thing of course is these contracts you know to rebuild Iraq yes where basically we've told those guys you know, you're sorry you're out of luck. You weren't with us when we went in. You're not going to be with us on the gravy train. Mm -hmm. The wild card here is, are the Europeans really pissed off enough to get off the plan and simply throw their own monkey wrench politically into the works and make public, regardless of what the plan is, what they find on Mars? And that's the possibility that I think is at least 50-50. <laughs> All right. Um, so they would be uh, angry and angry enough so that they now, would, would you blow, like to have, go ahead. blow the lid off this entire thing. Well, we have data. Remember, I try not, Art, and, and you know, keep, keep holding my feet to the fire because it's very important you do. I try to back up things I say. It's sometimes very hard in the political realm. I mean, scientifically, this is duck soup. You know, the, the title model, I have no doubt in my mind now that we're 99% right with the title model. The politics are so much more difficult because in politics, they can always change their mind. Tomorrow, something else can happen, so they decide, oh, no, we're going to do this as, as opposed to that. And you're not privy to 99.99% .99 of what's going on in the back rooms. Like, what happened when Baker really went to Germany, to France, and to Russia about the uh, the reparation of of, 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 of of the forgiveness of debts to Iraq, we don't know. Right, you I have no idea what the what the quid pro quo is and whether it's changed these politics. But let me tell you why I think maybe the Europeans have the bit in their teeth and they want to break cover and come out with some real, honest to God data. It goes back to Professor Newcomb when he gave his quote to the BBC and said that he had received emails from all over the world. That means this audience, <laughs> yes. guys and gals, right. it means you. And that these people had told him NASA is lying yes, about and, Mars. And he actually... Re okay. Um, let's imagine for a moment that it does turn up the cities. Yes. Um, oh, what a delicious idea. <laughs> uh, what sort of... Uh, societal reaction would you expect to that? Depends on how it is handled. It depends on how it is put out there. It depends who comes on board officially as authority figures and what they say. Well, you can't be too gentle about it. I mean, if the high European Space Authority says, look, cities, underground, well, ruins... No, 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 no. They're not going to say it that way. What, they, what I would do if I were in their, in their shoes, and this is what this memo from JPL basically is saying. Items of great geologic interest. Well, no, <laughs> they'll call them anomalies. Anomalies, yes. And they'll let us discuss it. They'll let us come on coast and on MSNBC where I've been invited and yes. who knows where. They'll let the Internet crowd have a field day with it. There will be long... You're... Uh... You're selling me what's already sold, Richard. I I firmly believe there are artificial things on Mars. I believe I've seen the cities beneath Mars. The water is there. I I, I believe all this, Richard. You don't okay. need to show me the geometry. And, well, but there are people in the audience maybe who have not terrestrial analogs. For instance, the um, the structure around this buttress. I've, I've been groping in my mind for what it reminds me of. Hmm. It reminds me of a lot of the rectilinearities around the Great Pyramid on the satellite imagery looking down on Egypt. Well, as interesting as this is, Richard, it's nowhere near the level of the picture of the cities. You might as well have put that up tonight if you really wanted to convince people. You mean the infrared yeah. visual comparison? Sure. sure. Well, I didn't for a very specific reason, because there's such contention about that image. That's one of the reasons why we have gone to Dr. Newcomb. Because according to Jim Garvin, remember the Mars guy at NASA headquarters? Yes. He said a year and a half ago that Newcomb's camera will be able to take new infrared imagery of Sidonia to compare with the visual imagery. Right. And will be able to 
to tell us if what we saw, what was leaked to us on that famous, I was doing my initial analysis. Uh, by the way, this is, that's the Monuments of Mars that's sitting on the edge of forever. Yes. The book that I always forget to plug, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is the chronology of this independent investigation going back now 20-some years. Anyway, in that, in that first edition in 87, I predicted that this structure, this incredible five-sided structure, was in fact an arcology, an enclosed artificial building of stupendous size built on Mars because that was appropriate to the Mars environment when whoever did this, but in fact, on this structure, we see myriad replicating cell-like features looking for all the world like the exposed interior of a multiple honeycombed-like arcology. Okay. And Newcomb, in color, at the right phase angle, and in stereo, will be able to confirm all this under a political system which has not been historically um, dissembling to us for the last 20 years on this subject. That's why that camera and that individual is so important. And the fact that we've got a healthy Mars Express spacecraft in orbit around Mars tonight is a major step forward in maybe finally answering this huge question. Which, of course, brings us to the question you posed earlier. Why the hell should we care? Why is it important exactly. to us? What, what questions will be answered or created, or what, uh, in what way will life change for us if you are correct? Well, let's start with the big and work backwards. Okay. You know, human beings have been looking for the last couple hundred years, ever since we invented the telescope, for company. Right, Art? Yes, sir. I mean, the, we have looked out there. There have been more books written on the subject, Are We Alone? Every NASA mission that leaves, there will be a press conference. And somebody at one of those press conferences will say, oh, and this mission will you know, give us more information on is the human race alone. NASA has sold its entire soul and its budget on the concept of people want to know the answer to that question. It's right up there along with, you know, why are we here? Why do we exist? It's, it's almost art like as if the human race was really, really, really lonely. And until it finds something that it can compare itself with, yes. it is missing a critical part of its own identity. And there's this subliminal part of each of us that yearns to know the truth behind that room i mean what's up you know these kinds of questions i really do want those answers and while i don't agree with richard on uh, every aspect of his presentation with regard to the secrecy behind all of this and the relationship uh, for example to uh, Egypt and a lot of other aspects that he will discuss with regard to the Mars mystery, can we call it that? Whether or not there is a civilization that at one time thrived on Mars is critically important to answering some of the aforementioned questions. So I'm with Richard on some of it. There's something on Mars. I'm pretty well convinced of that. And Therefore, this subject is not only viable, but critical to all of us. If you want to listen to our show ad-free, 24-7, access audio archives, live chat with me, and much more, you need to become a Coast Insider now. So you're telling me your grandmother, who died a few weeks ago, came and visited you last night in your bedroom, and you're not scared? Are extraterrestrials living among us? I don't know if it's true or not, folks, but we're going to find out. If you enjoy stories like these and want to learn more about the mysteries of the universe with me, become a Coast Insider now to access hundreds of our archive shows to listen anytime, anywhere. Sign up now at coasttocoastam.com slash coastinsider. That's coasttocoastam.com slash coastinsider. 